Our text today is a great chapter in the book of Romans. And if you know much about the, the book of Romans, it's a great dissertation, a great theological treatise on the sinfulness of man and the righteousness of God and how you and I can achieve that righteousness through the finished work of Christ. Amen. The last chapters of the book of Romans, the apostle Paul shifts over from theology to practical living. And he really makes several grand shifts, especially in chapter 12, where he exhorts the church at Rome that to, uh, to present their bodies as living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God, and on and on. Here in chapter 13, he begins dealing with the fact of our relationship, of course, to the government and to the law. And he said, let's every soul be subject unto the higher power. They were living under Roman tyranny. They were living under a tremendously corrupt system of government, similar to our own. They had an insane uh, man in the, uh, in the Caesars and those men that lived at Nero and others that were uh, occupying Rome and several of them were not only insane, they were probably demon possessed as well. And he says, let every sub soul be subject unto the higher powers for there is no power but of God and the powers that be ordained of God. He deals with us and our relationship to the laws of man and then he deals with this great relationship that we have to the supreme law of God. That law is that we would love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, and mind, and that we would love our what? Neighbor as ourselves, to love one another. And he spends several verses dealing with that great thought of us loving one another. In verse 8, he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Amen. He's not talking about necessarily emotional love. He's not talking necessarily about, uh, you know, the, the new love today that's all feeling based and emotion based. He's talking about loving one another with a pure heart fervently. And there's no conflict between being a convicted Christian who stands on the word of God and still loving the people around us and having compassion, making a difference for those who are without. Now in verse number 11 and 12, he reminds us about some very important truths. He said that knowing the time, knowing the time. Our daughter Bethany is a special needs girl, wonderful girl. She loves the Lord. She has a hard time expressing it. And when she's really settled and calm, she's just wonderful and sometimes gets very anxious and difficult to understand. Well, one thing, especially all the way back when she was little, we'd be driving up the road, three and four years old, mommy and daddy, and she'd say it five, 10 times a day. What time is it? What time is it, mom? What time is it, dad? She was always wondering about the time. And I'd have to tell her what time it is. We bought her several watches. We uh, bought her all kinds of devices. We have even in her room now a big clock. And it always gives it, you know, what time it is. Because she's very concerned about the time. The apostle says knowing the time. In other words, being aware, cognizant of the time and the era in which we live. That knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. The word high time means literally that time is up. You ever hear this? It's high time you do something about it. It's about time that you get things right. Look at that garage. It's about time you get it fixed. It's about time you clean it up. Somebody say amen right there. And I mean, it's this time is expired. The idea is that now it's time to get it done, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. I can make that statement every 30 seconds and it'll be true. That now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. I can repeat it again and again and again 
And every time I make that statement, it is true every time. Why? Because every tick of the clock, every hour, every day, every week, we are getting that much closer to the coming of Christ. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church over 2,000 years ago at Rome, and he's saying to them that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. Now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. He said, you got saved at a certain time, and you are that much closer to the coming of Christ. You understand that you're that much closer now? You are closer now to seeing Jesus than you've ever been at any period in your life, and just now, by the time I said it, I'm already behind because right now you're closer than you were 30 seconds ago. Every moment you and I are getting closer and closer and closer to eternity. Jesus is going to come. In fact, he said the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. He made it clear that he'll come in an hour when you think not. He's going to come in such a, a moment in the twinkling of an eye, just like that in an atomic second, the amount of time it takes for light to go past through the retina of the eye. That is how fast Jesus is going to come. And suddenly we'll be out of this world and we'll be into the next. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? And he said, now it is high time. And then our text, where he said to the church, not only is it high time, the night is far spent. Now, in other words, sleeping time is over. The night is over. The night is far spent. How many of you ever had a sleepless night? Can I see your hand? I had one, might have been Sunday night or Monday night, uh, it, one of these nights since I've been here. I couldn't sleep real well. I don't know whether it was the time change, jet lag, tacos, I don't know what it was, but I, I told the pastor, I said, if I eat any more of this, brother, uh, I'll have the four horsemen of the apocalypse run through this room. And, uh, and they did. But I'm saying to you, uh, man, uh, I don't know what it was. I had one of the sleepless nights, and I finally got to sleep after a while. But, uh, you know, when it was time to wake up, uh, I love the morning. I love the early morning. I like to get up before it gets, uh, before it gets light out, get everything moving, get my coffee made, get stuff happening, get my Bible out. And I like to bring the, uh, greet the, the morning by seeing the sun come up, seeing the light come out. And he's saying to us that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. The day, the day of Christ. Now this little phrase at hand occurs many times in your Bible. It is a phrase that means uh, literally the distance from about somewhere a little bit past your elbow to the, to the end of your fingertips. It's almost the same thing as a Hebrew cubit. And he said that the day of Christ, in other words, it is the day is within reach. It was the amount of uh, length that it took to reach out and to grab something. Think about it. When you go to your house tonight, you're going to reach in, out and you're going to open the door about the same distance from your hand, to the, from your body to the doorknob. When you turn it, that is how close we are to the day. You say, what day is that? Well, it's going to be the day of the Lord. This occurs in, in many instances. In fact, uh, you can find it over and over throughout the Bible. Joel chapter two, verse one said, blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land uh, tremble for the day of the Lord cometh. It is nigh, guess what? At what? Yeah. At hand. And then at Joel, Joel chapter two, Joel chapter one, verse 15, he said, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is what? at hand, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. He's Zephaniah 1, 7. He said, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. John the Baptist came and uh, one, of his, uh, one of the first times he appeared on the scene as the forerunner of Christ. He said in Matthew 3, 2, uh, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Hand. And then Jesus followed that in Matthew 4, 17, when he came preaching, uh, the Bible said he began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at 
hand over and over again. The Bible said that the day of the Lord, the kingdom of God, his presence is at hand. You and I are not far away from the presence of God. We are one breath, one beat of the heart away from eternity. We are just one blast of the celestial trumpet. When the trumpet of the Lord sounds, you and I will be called out of here and in that moment, you will be absent from the body and now present with the Lord. Amen. Preaching to church and Another man got saved about two years ago, and uh, he got excited. He came back the next night, and I don't know what I said, but uh, he went, yippee! I said, okay, well, anyway, uh, I said, well, he's supposed to be amen, but I kind of like that, yippee. That was just a guy who just expressed his joy about something, and uh, don't get any ideas, but I think it's a great thing uh, once in a while when you just get so happy, you cannot contain yourself. How many are you looking forward to seeing Jesus? I mean, to see him in all of his glory, the one who paid the price for every sin. So he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Philippians 4, 5, the writer would write from a jail cell and he would write uh, under incarceration. Yet he would say, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand hand. The apostle John was on the Isle of Patmos. You should see that beautiful place out in the Aegean Sea. You pull into the harbor and the mountain just goes right up. And I, I remember Susan and I just standing there and looking out on the Aegean Sea from the Isle of Patmos. And I said, this is where it happened, honey. This is where the revelation was given. This is where he saw the Lord as uh, the pastor read from tonight. And he saw the one who was dead and is alive forevermore. And as the keys of hell and death and he, he looked out, and this is what he said in Revelation chapter 1 and verse uh, number 7, I believe. He said to this, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3 rather, Blessed is he that readeth, and that, that hear, and that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. He said, you're going to get a blessing if you hold to the Word of God and hold to the book of Revelation and pray over it and study it and learn it for your life. And then in Revelation 22 10, near the end of the Bible, almost to the end of the book, he said this, uh, he saith unto me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at what? Is at hand. Right. He was saying, at the end of the age, the book is going to be unsealed. This is exactly what Daniel said. He was to seal up the book until the time of the end. But at the, at the time of, the, of come, the coming of Christ, he would see the unsealing of his book. And that is exactly what has happened in our lifetimes. And many of us, the last 75 years, we have watched the Bible unfold. We have watched the scroll open. We have seen what God is going to do in the end of the age. And Jesus is coming. And the day of the Lord is at hand. On May 4th, 1948, the UN General Assembly isn't that a great crowd of people? Help us right there. I need some help. <laughs> the UN General, General Assembly made a unanimous resolution to officially recognize the Jewish state. Our president made the announcement at about 6.35 uh, Eastern Standard Time. It went around the world that we have officially recognized the Jewish state. Isaiah 64 was literally fulfilled before our eyes. God said, as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth. He said, has, has anyone ever seen such a thing? Shall a nation be born at once? And yet we saw the rebirth of God's nation. I believe that moment those seals started to open up and we started to see the fulfillment of the word of God. Daniel would say in chapter number 12 that there be this great rise of knowledge and technology and travel. And Daniel 12, 4, but thou, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increase. Do you know that AI, the version right now, the IQ of the AI is somewhere right now over in the high 190s. 
Uh, Einstein had an IQ of about 150. They said that uh, version 2.0 of ChatGPT is coming out soon. It will be 300 times, not 300 plus, 300 times higher than the current version of AI. Knowledge is increasing, say amen to that. And I understand we now have something called Chat GPT Jesus, Chat with Jesus. Then you can ask uh, your iPhone, if you have the app, you can go on there and say, good morning, Jesus, and Jesus will talk to you. One man went on there and said, are you, uh, who are you? He said, I am Jesus. He said, which one? He said, I am the Jesus. He said, how can I know you're not an imposter? AI answered back and said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and I know that I am known to them. Listen, that's straight up creepy. Say amen to that. That's like Halloween or something. But anyway, uh, you understand we are living in a generation of people that is so uh, information and technology oriented. You can get from here. I can get from here to my house if I catch the right flight in about five and a half hours all the way across the country. Something would have taken you six and seven months to do not that long ago on a, on a horse covered wagon. Uh, everything has exploded. Information has exploded. Why is it all happening? because the day is at hand. We see the rise of the Antichrist system that we know about in Revelation chapter 13, where God said there'd be a day when no man can buy or sell except that he receive a mark in his right hand. Read your Bible, not on, in his right hand and in his forehead. And we'll be chipped or we'll have some microchip or a nanochip placed inside of us and just go by and scan. There are stores already that have palm scan technology. Whole Foods in some of their store chains now have palm scan technology. Uh, Amazon palm stores now have that. There are places that literally have already gone to cashless uh, purchase and cashless buying, we're heading uh, very fast toward the religion of the Antichrist, the rise of the beast system. That's going to happen. How many people know that's going to happen? The rise of violence and sin. God said, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In Matthew 24, 37, Jesus made that very clear. He said, when it gets so bad, there's our wars, rumors of wars, commotions, disturbances, earthquakes, pestilences, all these things. He said, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then he said, when you see uh, the, the fig tree putting forth her leaves, uh, you, you can know that it is near, uh, you, even uh, summer is nigh, even at the doors. You can know this. Since Israel was born and since Israel was rebirthed, Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. I do not know the day and hour and neither do you. And your favorite TV preacher doesn't know the day nor the hour either. Be careful for date setters. They are always wrong. Say amen. They have already denied what Jesus plainly said. We can't know the day. We can't know the hour, but we can know the times and we can know the seasons and we can look as God's people and wake up and see the fact that the day, the day is at hand. Noah, God said that the thought of man's heart was only to do evil continually. We live in a sinful generation. And if you study the days of Noah, The last thing God said about it before the flood was violence filled the earth. When people are unbridled and their sin is unbridled and their sin runs rampant, it is always followed by violence, killing, hurting, wounding, maiming, doing awful things. I saw on the news here in California, there's a school. A lot of the kids wouldn't go to school because of so many kids who were shot the other day. This is becoming a common occurrence everywhere we go. Why? Because we are living in the days of Noah. May I say to you tonight, the day is at hand. Let's read it again. Let's read the verse again. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Verse 12. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. And he said before that, that knowing the time, 
In other words, being alive, awake to what time it is, seeing what's going on in the world. And God said, the day is at hand. I've literally had young people come up and say, well, Brother Ross, you think Jesus is gonna come? Yes, I do. What about my wedding? <laughs> what about my wedding? I wanna get married. I said, you're gonna get married to Jesus. You're part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, amen? Would you rather get married to Jesus or Bubba? Say amen to that. Would you really, uh, I mean, I mean, you'd rather get married to Delbert than you would to Christ? I mean, you say, well, he's gonna enhance and change my life. He might, he might ruin your life. You understand, uh, he is a faithful savior. Say amen to that. He is the only true, one true and living God. And young ladies, so what about my wedding dress? You're gonna be uh, in fine linen, pure and white, which is the righteousness of the saints. You're you're gonna be dressed in the best looking dress you've ever seen in your life. We're gonna have beautiful, glorified bodies. We're, you're gonna look at your husband and say, wow, he looks so good. You look at your wife and say, you look so good. We're, we're gonna be back before uh, the fall and back before sin entered in. We are gonna be back uh, to the state that God made us, clothed with the glory of God. It's gonna be a wonderful day. We're gonna sit down at the marriage supper of the lamb. It's gonna be spaghetti. Lasagna, what's the name of that place? Patino's, Patillo's. Man, pastor took me to a place today. Uh, I mean, he ought to be on one of these food shows, brother. He knows exactly where to go. And we had the best pasta today and wonderful food. And imagine what it's gonna be like in the presence of the Lord. Amen. And here's the good news. That day is at hand. That's right. It's here. That's right. We don't have to wait too long. That's right. Jesus is going to come. Amen. He said, do you, believe, do you truly believe that, Pastor? I truly believe that with all of my heart. I know what the Bible teaches. I'm a student of prophecy. I've been watching what's happening in the Middle East, not from the eyes of the White House or what we're going to do or they're going to do or that one's going to do. I look at the shifting of nations and I see Gog and Magog and Tubal and Meshach and I see Togarma and all these nations with Turkey and Syria and, and Libya and Ethiopia and Iraq and Iran and I see all these nations and especially Iran all moving towards the north of Israel to come down like a great army and God himself is going to show himself as God. They're going to say, what happened? The day is no longer coming. The day is now at hand. The Lord is here. And I have three or four admonitions I'd like to give you tonight in relation to this. What's it mean for us? We can become obsessed with Bible prophecy and be so obsessed that we're really tough to be around. Almost, you know, so obsessed with all the fine points of Bible prophecy that you, you know, almost to be to the point of obnoxious. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And caught up with all the fine points of Bible prophecy. Now, what do you think, what color do you think the Antichrist eyes will be? Red or green? I said, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe they're going to be brown. I don't know. Maybe, but I'm saying to you, uh, who would know? And I'm not worried about it because the Bible doesn't teach that. The only thing I'm worried about is what the Bible teaches. Say amen. What's going to happen with the opening of the seals? I know this, they're going to be open. I know when that first seal is open, the revelation, uh, the tribulation period begins. There's going to be seven years of great tribulation. There are going to be seven seals with seven trumpets, with seven vials and bowls of the wrath of God pulled out, each judgment successively worse than the one before. And I want you to know this. Uh, if you love the Lord and you're saved and you know the Bible, you understand the fact that tribulation period, if you're saved by the grace of God, you will not be part of the tribulation. God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the same way God took Noah out before the flood, in the same way that God uh, took uh, his people out, he took Lot out before destruction. God is gonna take his church, his bride out before that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Uh, and God made it very clear, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words hey, I got some comfort for you 
Hang in there. You get to go through the seven-year tribulation period. You're going to have hailstones the size of, old, size of Volkswagens falling down on your head. You're going to be scorched. You're going to have all types of burns. Isn't that encouraging? Doesn't that sound good? No, we're going to escape that wrath. We're going to be caught up into the presence of God. You say, that's a pipe dream. Don't interrupt me. I'm having a good time. It's not a pipe dream. This is the word of God. This is what God has to say. And Paul wrote to the church of Thessalonica, said, don't let anyone, uh, uh, either by word or by letter, uh, don't let them bother you over the fact that the Lord had already come. They thought they missed it. And no, he said, he's not going to come till that man of sin be revealed and all the things that he said. He made it very, very clear there's going to be a falling away first. And here we are. How many of you know people that ought to be in church tonight? How many of you know people who hadn't been in church so long you couldn't find them with the FBI, amen? And they get saved and they, they start out well and you say, man, what happened? We love you. What happened to you? Well, just not into that anymore. I've seen some of the brightest people just growing in God, working in their life and something offend them. And now they're out of church and they're back to their old life and doing the things they did before. That's called the falling away or they've gone off, off and joined some uh, you know, rock and roll church with a bunch of leftover hippies there that are uh, calling themselves Jesus lovers. Listen, friends, uh, the Bible makes it very clear. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. If any man be in Christ, he is the what? Help me. New creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I was preaching in a church and a young lady came to see me. We led her to Christ years before. She came to see us down in Virginia. So I came by to see you and Mrs. Ross. I said, hey, how are you doing? Her name was Susan. How are you, Susan? She said, I'm doing great, but I sat out in the foyer. I said, oh, because I didn't see her during church. I said, why'd you sit out in the foyer? She said, because, you know, I'm not into preaching anymore. I don't like preaching anymore. I like teaching different style. I'm in the contemporary, you know, and I said, oh, it's a shame. I said, well, how would you have felt if you came in instead of me preaching? He said, Brother Ross, he's here. He's got a big drum set, double bass drums, 26 inch drums. He's got big cymbals all the way around. He's gonna do a big rock and roll drum solo during the intermission time. And he came in, I had long hair way over my shoulders like a hippie and uh, looked like something that the cat dragged in. When I got saved, uh, my hair looked like an explosion in a mattress factory, amen? And preaches, playing on the drum set, big old cigarette hanging out of my mouth, a little bottle of Jack, a little glass of Jack Daniels right there behind me. Jesus rocks, everybody rock, come on. I said, how would you have felt? She said, I would have been disappointed. I said, why would you have been disappointed? You've all gotten all freed up and liberated. Don't you want me to be freed up and liberated? You want me to be bound by this legalism, this life I live in? I said, yeah, but you're, you're brother Rossi. I said, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be a legalist, say amen. I'm supposed to be a bound up guy, right? I said, you know why you came here? You wanted us to tell you one more time. This stuff is not of God. You need to seek the Lord. And if you saw me up there playing that drum set like I used to do and be a headbanger and all that stuff that uh, rockers do and had a big old uh, thing on my drum stool, rock for Jesus on the back and all that, I'm telling you, you would have come in here and thought, what happened to him? He's backslidden. She said, that's true. I said, could I suggest to you <laughs> that you're backslidden? And you understand the fact that we're living in a generation of people who've traded old time religion off of this newfangled stuff. It's they're being set up for the Antichrist and his lie and his deception. And understand tonight there's three or four things. First of all, we need to wake up. All that wasn't in my notes. That's where I get in trouble. Wake up. We need to wake up. Ephesians 5, 14, wake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. And that's what he said to us in this text tonight. He begins, knowing the time, it is now time to awake 
out of sleep. The last thing we need to be is a slumbering church full of slumbering people. They say, well, I've led, led people to Christ. I've been praying for the last few days in my life. I said, Lord, I don't want to give old illustrations. I don't want to talk about what we used to do. I don't want to talk about how it used to be. I want to talk about people getting saved right here, right now, present tense, serving Christ, soul winning, praying, being what God wants us to be. And to awake, number one, we need to wake up. Number two, number two we need to clean up. We need to clean up our act. To get things right, why? Because the Lord, the Lord, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. It's going to happen. Just, that was weak, but anyway, it's going to happen. Still weak. It's going to happen a lot louder than that. It's going to be a trumpet. It's going to be a spiritual trumpet. And when that trumpet sounds, I believe it's going to be the angel of the Lord. And when he sounds that trumpet, suddenly will be transformed and changed in a moment. And suddenly he is coming back for a holy bride, a precious bride, a righteous bride for his glory. That's why the parable of the 10 virgins, they, some, of those, some of those virgins had oil in their lamps, some did not. They were waiting for the bride, uh, for the bridegroom and under that uh, wonderful system of life they lived under, the bridal procession would come. It would be the bridegroom in the night with torches and lamps and there would be a herald to say, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And he would go into the bridal chamber and they would consummate their wedding that they had already begun uh, sometimes several years before, but now was the wedding night and she had to be ready and waiting for when her bridegroom was to come. We need to get cleaned up. God's people need to live a clean and holy and separated life. Pastor can interrupt me if I'm wrong. When I got saved, brother, they preached against everything. I mean, they did. I mean, they preached against everything. We go to church and say, well, what's it gonna be today? <laughs> the pastor say, you need to get right with God. You need to quit smoking, amen. Oh. So, uh, man, I'd quit smoking for the 30th time and I, you need to quit. And uh, I'd go to the altar and try to again and again and again and quit and finally got victory. And man, that's great. You need to quit gossiping. And I'm all, oh, brother. And uh, it was just one thing after the other. And God started cleaning our lives up, getting us changed. We couldn't wait to get to church to hear what the pastor was going to preach about. What'd you think about the pastor's message? A little strong. What do you think? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I mean, he, he acts like we, you know, like we're a bunch of sinners. He acts like we're all something wrong with us. Man, I want to go to church and be uplifted. Good morning. Good evening. It's an evening with Lou. Amen? But I'm saying, I mean... <laughs> Hello, you can have your best life now, everyone. <laughs> Amen. Oh, hold it. I got to go to the, I got to go to the parlor and get my hair all curly permed. Amen. That's right. But I'm telling you, and there's a place for encouragement, friends, but what, there's, there's also a place where we just need to repent and get it right. Listen to what Peter said about that. Pastor mentioned it. Second Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works uh, that are therein shall be burned up, seeing that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in a holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? That day is at hand. Wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. It's a question. What kind of persons ought we to be? What kind of holy people right. ought we to be? Right. Even in Romans 13 in our text, he said to us that uh, we're to, uh, the night is far spent. Let's cast off the works of darkness. Let's put on the ar armor of light. Uh, walk honestly as in the day, not rioting, drunkenness, not in chambering, wantonness, not in strife and envying. A few years ago, there was a big Facebook post. Carl Lentz, the pastor of the Hillsong Church, was sitting in a bar with Justin Bieber. Uh, Bieber, not Bieber. 
Leave it to Bieber. But anyway, and there's Justin Bieber. And there's this pastor, Justin Bieber, drinking shots with Carl Lentz. May the Lord help us. May God forgive us. Say amen. And anytime a pastor's out here drinking a few shots of Seagram 7 with the church members, we are in trouble. It's time to clean up. We, our, my parents went to home, Rome when I was in high school. We sent them to Rome for a special trip. The whole family pitched in. I was in the 10th or I think 11th grade. And when they let, walked out the door, they were to be gone for like 16 days to Rome. I said, it is party time at our house. They were gone. I played hooky from school. I did all kinds of terrible stuff. Man, we had just an ongoing party. And I kept saying, well, they get back uh, in three days. We ought to start cleaning up. There was dishes in the sink. It looked like animals had moved into their house. My mom was very clean. I said, it's all right. We know when they're coming home. We'll just get it all cleaned up, everything right. We were home one day just having a time. Had my buddies there. Had the stereo on in their living room, blasting out as loud as it would go with rock music. The front door opened, and I looked up, and they came home two days early. My mom was very feisty. She came in and she didn't say a word. She just started crying and went into her room. I mean, I'd rather gotten yelled at, say amen. And my dad walked and looked at me and just shook his head and they both went into the bedroom. They didn't yell, they didn't holler, they didn't throw a fit, she did later. But I mean, you talk about one to feel this big. I can't imagine when the Lord comes back. We need to clean up. We need to wake up. We need to make up. We need to get things right with people. Amen? We can't be at odds with people. He mentioned that earlier on in the same chapter. He said in verse number eight, Oh, no man, no man anything but to love. And he saw the command is, it is briefly comprehended in this, in verse nine, saying, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. When's the last time you went to somebody and said, Hey, brother, sister, I'm sorry. I was wrong. You were right. Please forgive me. I haven't been here in a while. It's been a couple of years. You might have forgotten that little phrase. You want to try it with me? I'm sorry. Sorry. I can't hear you very well. I'm sorry. sorry. I was wrong. wrong. You were right. right. It's the hardest one. (laughs) Will you forgive me? you You ought to try that with your spouse. You ought to try that with your you see, if I tell my wife I'm wrong, I'm sorry, she's going to go, you know, wives don't, not, not every wife gets hysterical. A lot of them get historical. Say amen. <laughs> Bring up stuff we did 20 years ago. <laughs> Honey, that's, that's all in the blood. Yeah, but I just remembered it. <laughs> and like it was yesterday. <laughs> amen. If I say I'm sorry to my husband, he's going to give me a technological lecture. He's a, he's a maniac. He has a little ball hanging from the garage that I'm supposed to touch with the windshield. And one day I just decided I was going to hit it, and then I hit the black. But anyway, and, and we all have our issues. Do I have an amen? But it's okay to say, I'm sorry. The Lord's coming back. We have offended people. Let's make it right. And even though we might even be in the right in, at times, if we're saved, we don't have any rights. We just lay them at the cross and learn to be dead to self and say, I'm sorry, I hurt you and I, and I wounded you. We need to make up. And then, of course, we need to look up. I'm almost done. Jesus said in Luke 21, 28, when you shall see these things come to pass, and he talked about all the signs of the end times, he said, look up. Lift up your heads. Your redemption draweth nigh. Why? Because he's at hand. Amen. He's right there. He's coming. And finally, we need to suit up. 
We need a dress up, if you will. You say, really, what do you mean? A suit and tie? No, not necessarily. I don't know that a suit and tie is always necessary. If I'm preaching, I'm going to wear a, uh, I'm going to wear a coat and a tie because this is, a, this is an important thing to me. But I'm talking about the inner man. Because right. you can look good on the outside and be nothing more than an old Pharisee that's, you know, uh, outwardly beautiful but inwardly dead. Right. Verse 14, and I close. But put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because the day is at hand. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lusts thereof. He's coming back. And it's going to happen very, very soon. The true story is told of a Wall Street prominent attorney. He died in the early 1900s. He was a well-known, renowned attorney. Handsome man, single guy, never married. Very wealthy, sharp, articulate, hadn't lost a case, and he died very suddenly. They went through his effects and his remains, and he said in his will and his testament, I want to be taken down to Georgia where I came from, and I want to be buried in this cemetery, and he named the cemetery exactly where it was. They took all of his remains down. They took him to an old cemetery, There he had a little tiny grave plot with just a little small headstone. When they got to the gravestone and when they got to the cemetery, he wanted a letter read by the pastor, and the letter read the pastor to all those in attendance. Since some of you may wonder why I was buried in this cemetery in the deep south, if you didn't notice, this is an old cemetery that was people who are either formerly slaves or died when they were slaves before the war and people were emancipated and many of them lived in the South afterward and helped in homes, but they lived very, very meager lives. He said, I wanted to be buried here because next to me is a lady that had a great influence on my life. He said, I grew up in a Southern plantation We were not slave owners because the war had ended. We had several families that lived on our plantation. They were our employees. And one lady was our, my personal housemaid and nanny. She was a older black lady and she would wake me up every morning and she would say to me, wake up my boy, it's morning. And get me out of bed and get me ready for the day. Each night she would come to my bed as a little boy and she would pray for me and read the Bible to me and have devotions with me. He said, when I was an 11-year-old boy, I knelt alongside of my bed with her and she led me to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and I was saved. Since she passed away several years ago now, And I always wanted to be buried right next to her because I can hear her in the resurrection morning. I can hear her saying to me, wake up, my boy. It's morning. And and it was a wonderful testimony to all who heard. Let's wake up. The day is at hand. Christ is coming back. He's about that far away in the light of eternity and time, and space, and let's be ready for when Jesus comes back.